Congress getting tough on the rise in anti-Semitism on our nation's campuses. Liberal universities becoming cesspools of pro-Hamas hatred. And today, the presidents of three major universities, Harvard, UPenn, and MIT, three schools I never applied to, had to explain to lawmakers why they haven't reined in radical anti-Israeli students who've made life a living nightmare for Jewish students, 73% of whom say that they've experienced or seen anti-Semitism on campus. Our university, revered for its pursuit of knowledge, has devolved into an arena where Jewish students tiptoe through their days, uncertain and unsafe. Unmistakable anti-Semitism that I've experienced on campus is reminiscent of the Jew hatred I've heard about from my grandparents, Holocaust survivors. This is not just harassment. This is our lives on the line. The most heated moment? New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik pressing Harvard's president about the calls for genocide against Jews, which took place on her campus. You understand that the use of the term intifada in the context of the Israeli-Arab conflict is indeed a call for violent armed resistance. Do you believe that type of hateful speech is contrary to Harvard's code of conduct, or is it allowed at Harvard? It is at odds with the values of Harvard. Can you but not say here that it is also, against the code of conduct at Harvard? We embrace a commitment to free expression. What action has been taken against students who are harassing and calling for the genocide of Jews on Harvard's campus? I can assure you we have robust What actions have been taken? I'm not asking. actions underway. I How did you think the president of Harvard came across at the hearing today, Dana? Like she had been overly prepared by lawyers and is concerned about backlash on her campus if she were to just simply answer the question about the genocide of Jews, with, if that is bullying and harassment. I think the only answer to that is yes, yes. And as Larry Summers said, there's been a double standard in the way these university leaders respond to racism, right? So other forms of prejudice, we know how that's gone. We know even, for example, the president and the vice president any hint of racism, they'll be out there on camera interviews. They'll be out there doing a press conference. All this White House has done, I mean, I'm not saying that they're for anti-Semitism, of course not. But is it too much to ask for the President of the United States to do an on-camera statement about this? He's doing a lot of fundraisers this week and great, go for it. I know you wanna run for re-election and have enough resources to do that. But there are those students today, we were the only network that took those students live, their press, their press conference today, and I'm so glad we did. Very impressive young people. And their pain is real. They're saying, like, we are actually concerned about our safety. And they were representing their other students. The other thing is, they can't get their education. The, the classes are interrupted. They have to walk through all these protests in order to get from one part of the school to the other. We had this other gal on today, Noah Fay from Columbia University. She's a brave young woman. She's the RA, the resident assistant um, manager for her dorm. She has vandalism on her door, on her board. On, they are dealing with so much, and it would not hurt the campus presidents or even our president to say something to them. They're asking for it. It's the first time I've felt bad for an RA. Mm. <laughs> Jessica? I thought the students were fantastic. I can't imagine being able to express myself so clearly and about a subject so difficult at that age. And I struggle, turn, I'm turning 40 with issues mm -hmm. that are so personal to me now. Um, so kudos to them and for standing up for themselves. I'm noticing um, amongst my friends, um, fellow Jews who went to a lot of these Ivy League schools, my text messages are full of a lot of remorse. And what are we going to do, right? By the time that our kids are getting ready to, to go to school, hopefully we will not have forgotten this as well, that this is how the administration responded to these kinds of things. Um, I am surprised that there hasn't even been, and I know it's the most base level, but a bit of a reversal when they're seeing the dollars pour out the door. Because people are going to continue to do this and more and more people are going to say, I'm not, you're not getting my donation. Dana had um, one of the biggest donors to UPenn on this morning on America's Newsroom, who I thought um, was really interesting. And the point that he highlighted that I think is important to call out again is that this is not a new thing, that foreign dollars have been coming into American universities for a very long time. And it's not just to put up buildings, but it's to change the culture and the way that people think about Israel um, 
and Jews writ large around the world. And I want to tell everyone as well to take a look at Bill Ackman, who founded um, Persian Capital, um, billionaire investor. He published his second letter that he sent to Dr. Gay, the president of Harvard. She did not respond to the first one. Mm -hmm. um, noting in it that Harvard actually ranks in the bottom 25% in terms of the free speech rankings. And he spoke to a bunch of faculty members who didn't use their names because they want to keep their jobs, which makes sense. But some quotes, um, years ago, Harvard stopped being a place where all perspectives were welcome. And then he asked about why this was different than another, other Middle East conflicts, because we know it's going on constantly. And one of the professors said, Israel is the rare case where we have a hot conflict between people that are deemed white versus people of color. And I have been resistant um, to buy into the argument that this is about race and that there, it is impossible to people to see white people as victims. But as more of this footage comes out of the rapes, as Greg says, sexual atrocities um, that were committed by Hamas, I, I don't know how people can look themselves in the mirror mm -hmm. and not call this explicitly what it is when you see the gang rapes the child rapes, the death and destruction reaped by Hamas. Yeah, how big of an issue is the racial component to this conflict? I think I think I, it, what Jessica is saying is kind of a realization that you are no longer considered a marginalized group. You are considered part of the white oppressor. Mm -hmm. And it, when that happens, everything is permissible, even laughing or mocking a sexual atrocity. You know, there is a pro-Palestinian side that makes a sound argument. You know, being critical of Israel doesn't make you anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. But that's not the argument anyone's making on the street or on campus. We can be critical of Israel the same way we can be critical of France or Germany. That isn't what's happening here. It's the refusal to accept the sexual atrocity, despite mountains, mountains of evidence. You know, and that any country that falls victim to that has a right to respond. If Let's say if you just, if, if you're talking to a protester, I always try to figure out how do you talk to them. Take Israel and Palestine out of this. You walk into a room and there's a gang of young men raping and then murdering a helpless female. Do you suddenly add historical <laughs> context to that? And over time, do you then bring in nuance and debate over the troubled relationships maybe her parents or grandparents had with those guys' parents? It's like, no, you don't. You punish those people. You have to keep throwing this in their face. Sec this is a sexual atrocity. There's no historical context for it. As for the college president, she's so gay. Dr. Gay? Yes. Dr. Gay, Harvard president. Judge Jeanine, take us home. You know, what it reminds me of is, you know, if you prosecute, you know, for murder or sexual violence, never, ever does a defense attorney come in and say, well, you know, there was always bad blood there. There is justification in the penal law for this. I mean, this is a whole new upside down way of thinking that is bizarre and is not consistent with what a civilized society does and acts. I have a couple of thoughts. Number one. Um, it's very interesting. We've heard for years that si that 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 uh, speech is violence, and uh, you know, whenever a conservative speaks, it's violence. We got to shut them down. We can't allow them to speak. And now, all of a sudden, speech that promotes violence is protected speech. So I I came out after reading this segment, uh, uh, the the paperwork, and I said, what was the point of this hearing? Was it a hearing where everybody just comes out and says, you're bad and, and we're good, we don't want to tolerate it? Unless Congress comes up with legislation or does something that, that punishes this kind of behavior, there was no point to all of this other than a dog and pony show that we see every day in Congress. Now, rest assured that even Harvard, the University of Pennsylvania and these um, Ivy schools get federal grants, they get federal contracts, they get tax breaks. Why should the American people be subsidizing any of these schools if there are Jewish students, girls and boys, young men, young women, who are afraid to go to class, afraid because they might be either raped or assaulted because of who they are? That is a hate crime. And you know, forget about the, these universities saying, we're going to cut back the amount you need to give in order to be an important donor. No, you take away the federal benefits and you shut them down. Okay.
Up next, a bad sign for Democrats? Kamala Merch is not selling. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.